Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, David Rosen. I am the Professor of Anthropology here at Fairleigh Dickinson University's College at Florham. And uh, as you know, this uh, program was scheduled to, uh, um, to receive uh, Ambassador Josephine Ojiambo. Um, so far, we're still awaiting the ambassador, but in the meantime, we have the uh, very able Ambassador uh, Kamal, who has done so much to make these programs possible. We'll uh, begin to address the issues, and hopefully, um, uh, Ambassador Ojiambo will, uh, will, will appear at some point. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome the participation of our external sites, uh, Lehigh University, Bronx Community College, Mercy College, as well as the sister campus of Fairleigh Dickinson University in Vancouver, British Columbia, and our Metropolitan Campus. And of course, uh, this event is uh, at least starting here at, uh, at the College at Florham. And today's topic uh, is especially important in the light of the events unfolding in recent days, uh, both in uh, Libya and in uh, the Ivory Coast. Uh, the topic is democracy and strife in Africa. The format of the program will be the usual one for this series. Uh, Ambassador Kamal will open with a 30-minute discussion of the issues. Following this, there will be a question and answer session. There will be two questions from each of the participating institutions. And if time permits, we will try for a second round of questions. So without any further delay, I hand over this important discussion uh, to Ambassador Kamal. But it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and those of you who know me uh, know that uh, I have always felt that since the human species was born out of East Africa, that is the origin of the human species. Therefore, all of us, without exception, at uh, Lehigh or Bronx or Mercy or Fairleigh Dickinson, wherever it may be, all of us are Africans in origin. Our ancestors are common and they are all African. And so Africa is the mother load for human society. And therefore it interests us. It interests us because it is important and because not only has it contributed a lot in terms of thinking to global civilization, but because it is now facing a downturn in uh, the number of problems that are coming up in Africa. And so let us try to analyze the types of problems that we are facing in Africa. And there are two or three types. The first is, and the oldest, is the starting of civil strife in Africa. This is particularly true of East Africa, where colonial borders were drawn up by a bunch of uh, drunken colonial powers in Berlin who after having imbibed uh, a lot of whiskey would pull out a map and in a drunken state with a blue pencil draw lines on a map. And those blue lines cut across tribal affinities and tribal and family loyalties. And as a result, you got a bunch of states, colonial states with absolutely artificial borders in Africa, which worked as long as there was a colonial power sitting on top saying, this is mine, this is yours. And do not underestimate the mine and the yours, because a country like the Congo, which is the size of the United States, was a personal possession. I repeat, a personal possession of the king of the Belgians. It did not belong to Belgium. It was the personal property of the king of the Belgians. That is the history of colonialism of mine and yours. But what happened was that these borders uh, uh, became, because they were so artificial, because they did not coincide with either the nationality of peoples 
or natural borders as we have in the Pyrenees or the Alps in Europe or the Himalayas in Asia. Because of that, the minute the colonial powers disappeared, problems started coming up. Now, colonialism was then so overtaken by a second force, which was also a very powerful force, which was the Cold War. <clears throat> the Cold War uh, divided the world into two parts. And because of that clear division into two parts, <clears throat> you had all the countries and all the leadership of all the countries joining either one side or the other with a very large group in the middle which, which said we don't want to be on one side or the other. And so you had the Soviet bloc, you had the NATO uh, bloc, and you had the non-aligned movement in the middle. The non-aligned movement then became extremely important. It was important because uh, its help and its vote was needed by both sides both the Soviet bloc and the uh, Western bloc. And so from 1946 until 1990, I was wined and dined every day. I got a free lunch every day from the Soviets and a free dinner every day from the Americans because uh, countries were important and therefore the vote was important. But then Another third event occurred, and that was the disappearance of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And that suddenly upset the entire world. Most people in the United States think the end of the Cold War was good. But three quarters of the world thinks it was bad, that the Cold War was good, and that the end of the Cold War was bad, because it reduced the importance of the middle countries and the middle countries are 134 out of 192. And these countries, which had so much importance during the Cold War, suddenly did not know who to be non-aligned with or against and lost their importance. And since they lost their importance, and since colonialism was in any case uh, dead, after 1960 and this huge decolonization movement. Therefore, ethnic rivalries inside the countries started bubbling. The pressure cooker, the lid, had been taken off at the end of the Cold War. And ethnicities started bubbling out of control. And you saw that happening everywhere, but most particularly in Africa, where we saw some extremely sad events, of which Rwanda jumps to mind. Uh, Rwanda, where you had a massacre of almost a million people in eight weeks without guns, only using knives and machetes. People had their throats slit, a million people in two months. And so that was the degree of ethnicity and of ethnic uh, tension which had been kept intact by colonialism and then by the Cold War and which suddenly had now been allowed to bubble over. And so very suddenly we saw at the United Nations, for example, in the High Commission for Refugees, the major refugee movements before that were in Asia, in uh, Afghanistan uh, with 5 million refugees in Pakistan and Iran or in Cambodia because of the Pol Pot. Suddenly we found that Asia was being overtaken by Africa and the refugee burden in Africa jumped because of events in the Congo, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in all this region in Uganda. And so the question was, how do we deal with this problem? And I just want you to know that we have not succeeded in dealing with it, even today, 20 years after 
the end of the Cold War. That was problem number one. Problem number two was this recent event in, uh, in the Middle East, which started in Africa because the spark came in Tunisia, where one man, I repeat, one man put himself on fire because he was a fruit seller and he felt that the police had been unfair to him. And that snowballed into a revolt of the people and the street in Tunisia until the government had to fall. And then it leapfrogged into Egypt. Now Tunisia is a relatively small country and problems in Tunisia can be controlled. But Egypt is the center of the Arab world, the absolute center. 80 million people, very old civilization, very politicized country, very educated country. And when in Egypt, suddenly we have people coming out into the street and sustaining themselves in the street, this was something totally unforeseen by all intelligence services around the world, including this extraordinary intelligence service, which is the US intelligence. No early warning came about how Egypt was going to blow up in this fashion, but it did. And once Egypt did, then I'm afraid all bets were off. And so it spread into Yemen, into Bahrain, into Jordan, into Syria, and who knows where, into Algeria, into Morocco, and who knows where else. And so we have a, an expanding African problem, type two, type one being decolonization and ethnic strife, type two being frustration of youth against the a, a governments which were sitting for far too long with no line of change and no ability to create jobs, which is what was really required. And then you have type three. Type three is Cote d'Ivoire. It's a totally different type of case. The problem in Cote d'Ivoire is, in a way, the concept of responsibility to protect or R2P. We have said in the UN that all governments have the right to and the responsibility to protect their minorities and their oppositions. And that requires tolerance and respect and an ability to incorporate the opposition through some process. You can call it periodic and genuine elections, you can call it advisory boards, you can call it what you will. But you have to incorporate the frustrations of the opposition into the governmental structure. That is responsibility to protect, which means responsibility to protect minorities and the opposition. And the question was, who will has the responsibility to protect? And when we discussed this in the United Nations, the idea was that it is essentially the duty of the government of a country to protect its opposition and its minorities. So R2P devolves upon the governments of the respective countries themselves. But then the UN went across the border, went across the line, and said that if you, as a country and as a government, do not protect your citizens, and if you are found wanting, and if you are unwilling or unable to do that, then it is the responsibility of the international community to come in and help you protect. In other words, the border was being eroded and crossed. Now that created an enormous debate in the UN and it has not been resolved. Because on the one side you have the countries which defend the idea of sovereignty, meaning that inside my house I am sovereign and I will take care of my problems and that's it. 
and if there is somebody who opposes me, it is for that person to come and push me out. But no outsider can enter my house. And opposed to that is the concept of R2P with external uh, imposition of solutions, which is, as I said, the erosion of the border. And that debate, incidentally, is a continuing debate because even though R2P has been passed by the General Assembly, it is not quite, not quite an accepted uh, uh, concept yet in the United Nations because of the strength of the idea of sovereignty and because the United States opposes the idea of R2P. Because R2P means that if a state cannot defend its minorities, it becomes the duty of other states. I repeat, the duty of other states to intervene and protect the minorities. And the United States says it's not the duty. It is the duty of the Security Council and we will then decide in which case we want to intervene and in which case we do not want to intervene. In other words, the United States is not willing to accept, quote unquote, the automaticity of responsibility to protect anywhere and everywhere. It wants to retain the right to decide. So R2P on one side is continues to be under discussion. But the case in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, is now an R2P case. Here you have a situation where you have an internal strife between two opposing camps and strong opposing camps in which you have one side which says I won the election and the other side which says but I have also won the election. And so there are two winners of the election and there is civil war which starts. And that civil war now requires the government to maintain the sovereignty of the country and the opposition to continue to push it. And this is where the new event comes in, in Côte d'Ivoire. And that new event is the intervention by the United Nations and by France. That is external intervention. External intervention has taken sides and has taken the side of one side over the other and yesterday has bombarded and arrested one side and therefore tilted the balance entirely in favor of the other side, the so-called winner of the election. But there is a major question which remains. Is it for France to decide who is the winner of the election or is it for the people of Côte d'Ivoire themselves to decide who is the winner of the election and which government they want? And that question is going to belabor us for the future. Côte d'Ivoire is, people think that it is the problem is solved. Mr. Babo is gone and Mr. Watara is now the president. But you will see that the strife and the tension and the questions over French intervention and the reasons for the French intervention. How do we know why the French intervened? What were French interests in Côte d'Ivoire? Because uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch in international relations. And so we have to examine what are French interests? Why are they suddenly so keen on, the, on, on bringing a person of their own choice as the president of Côte d'Ivoire? And that then, the same case, brings us back into Libya. Libya is identical to this Côte d'Ivoire case because here once again you have two camps. You have a government and you have an opposition. And the government is powerful because it has the power of government behind it, which means uh, tanks and guns and structure. And then you have an opposition which is more or less ragtag with a militia type opposition. But militias ultimately can win. We know that. The United States is a case in point. 
There was a militia here which took the opposition against an established authority called the British Empire. And the militia ultimately was able, touch, it was touch and go until the Battle of Trenton. But ultimately, the militia organized itself into an army and ultimately was able to defeat the established government, namely the British Empire and as a colonial power over the United States. And so in Libya, we are in the middle of that type of a civil war. And a lot of people are, die, are dead and a lot of more people are going to die in Libya because the case is not clear at all. On both sides have great defenders and uh, it's fascinating to see what is happening in North Africa because the Libyan case, like the Egyptian and the Tunisian case, is a case not of a militia really, but of youth standing up and saying, we want something else. And if you look at this youth, you find that they are young and they are headless. There's no leader. It's really a mass movement without a leader. And that's unique because this is true revolution. It's revolution in the street. But these revolutions, as you know, we know from the past revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. Revolutions do not solve problems. They only start a new phase. And it takes a long time for revolutions to work their way out. The American Revolution started, took a hundred years before it went into a civil war, took another hundred years before it ended segregation. And some people say, well, we are still in the middle of a civil war in the United States. The French Revolution started, went into, talked about the rights of man, went into Africa, exercised colonialism for 150 years, denied the rights of man to the African colonies, ultimately had to back down, and till today is going through the, the, the tensions of a people who do not quite know how to adjust to the rights of man, who to give rights to and who to deny rights to, how to adjust between uh, the universal norms and cultural differences. That is France. And we know the case of China and uh, Iran both, both of which are going through relative agony. And so I'm happy to come back to you to, to face questions from your side uh, on uh, any matters relating to Africa. It is a continent with whom I have fair knowledge because I have dealt deeply with Africa for several years, for at least six years, uh, and traveled extensively in that continent uh, uh, over during my career. Over to Lehigh for questions from that end. Uh, my question is related to uh, the U.S.'s role in the recent uh, intervention in Libya. We've been criticized in the past for being uh, global policemen at, in the United States. Um, but uh, in this situation, one could argue that we took more of a backseat, that we were drawn into the, the um, intervention um, kind of by the force of a few other nations as well. Um, what's your view on the, the United States' um, willingness in the past to kind of uh, make interventions and make decisions above and beyond the, the role of, their role in the UN? Do you feel like um, those decisions are uh, well represented in the UN, that those uh, decisions are um, brought to the global community first and then made, or do you have some criticism in terms of how these decisions are made uh, above and beyond the, the UN's authority? Okay, second question from Lehi. Yeah. Yeah. Lehi, second question. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we thank you for the presentation. We're very curious um, in terms of asking the question, we're very uh, interested and curious about what exactly would dictate 
um, intervention on behalf of the United Nations in certain countries and no, interve no intervention in other countries or limited intervention, different, different degrees of intervention in certain countries. Um, it's, it's difficult to understand what would create the right circumstance to require intervention. That's something we're very curious if there are certain guidelines or if certain situations simply call for intervention. As usual, very good questions from Lehi. There are two questions. Let me take the first one first. Namely, uh, what is the role of the United States in Libya? And how is it going to be judged by the American audience itself and by history? And this is a very important question. The problem of the United States is twofold. The first is that this is a country with very strong principles and they are defined because it is born out of a defense of those principles. But at the same time, this is a country which has interests. And the whole problem is how to correlate principles with interests. The United States has a principle. Let me tell you the principle of the United States in Africa. The United States intervened along with Pakistan very deeply in Somalia in 1992. And at that time, the US and Pakistan, both of us, lost seriously Uh, lost uh, uh, a large number of soldiers in Somalia. Now, the result of the deaths of the Pakistani soldiers, you know, Pakistan is a heartless country, and so soldiers die, we don't care. And in any case, we've got too many soldiers, so the more of them that die, the better off we are. Uh, with so much military dictatorship in the country, we are not great lovers of our army. But the United States had two of its soldiers with their dead bodies tied to the back of jeeps and camels and dragged through the town of Mogadishu. And this was photographed on television. And it produced a tremendous impact all over the country. How can American soldiers be dragged their dead bodies through the country? And it is true because we have a principle that we do not mistreat the soldiers of other countries. Soldiers are very high class people because they are sent abroad to die. And when they die, you respect them, whether they are yours or that of the other country. And so the disrespect that was shown to the American soldiers created an enormous impact in the United States. And the United States then took a strategic decision I repeat, a strategic decision, which was, in future, no American boots on the ground in Africa. Full stop. No American boots on the ground in Africa. And that remains, until today, a fundamental strategic decision of the United States. Now you have the Libyan problem. Libya is important. It has oil, and oil is the key to everything. Uh, Libyan oil is only 1% of U.S. imports, but oil is oil. It is what makes the machines of the world turn. And so the U.S. cannot stay idle. They have to do something. But they don't want to put boots on the ground in Libya. And so what do you do? You push, you somehow get a UN uh, resolution, which is a weak resolution, because it got only 10 votes out of 15. The other five important members abstained, which means that they had doubts. They allowed the resolution to go through. They did not veto, but they did not like it at all. 
and five out of ten is a very large percentage in the UN. And so we went in and the US then bombed from the air under so-called saving civilians, etc. The problem is you cannot, you cannot win wars from the air. It cannot be done. And the US knows this better than anybody else because this is the Vietnam case where air power was used and it just could not survive. And so the US very wisely after an initial campaign has said, ladies and gentlemen, it's been good to know you, but I've got to be moving along. And so they've handed it over to the French and the British. And the French these days, as you can see, in Côte d'Ivoire are full of uh, testosterone. And so they've said, we'll go in and we'll do whatever they can. And, you know, these are the same French who lost their whole country to the Germans in six weeks. But now they think they can do it. Okay, we'll see what they can do. But we are now facing a situation in Libya where there are two sides. Where, they, you, as I said, you have a government with a depleted army on one side and uh, not a very smart government. And on the other side, you have a militia, which is, we don't know who is in charge. We don't know what is their manifesto. They have a one point manifesto, get rid of Gaddafi. That's not good enough as a manifesto, as we know from Egypt, that you get rid of Mubarak, it does not solve the problem. That's why people are still in Tahrir Square in Cairo. And so we don't know what is going to happen uh, to Libya and certainly don't know how is the U.S. going to deal with it. Because the U.S. is, you know, like this pretty girl and you ask yourself, does she or doesn't she? Does she want to get rid of Gaddafi or does she not want to get rid of Gaddafi? We don't know. They say we don't want to get rid of Gaddafi, but we don't like him. You've got to decide one way or the other. And that decision is a does she or doesn't she uh, a problem in Libya. Your second question was about what justifies intervention in one case and does not justify intervention in another case. Fabulous question. This is in the middle of the debate again, globally and in the United Nations. It's in the middle of the debate because we've seen this happen before. We saw, just to give you a, a previous example, a physical invasion of a country called Iraq at a very high cost, but a physical invasion on the grounds that the leader was bombing his own people. Well, next door, we had another country called Chechnya, where the leader was bombing his own people in front of us on television. We saw television images of the Russian government firing tanks into the parliament with the, with the deputies, the, the, the parliamentarians inside. So the deputies were being murdered in front of us in real time and we did nothing. So we intervened in Iraq and we did not intervene in Chechnya. It was an obvious example. Now you have the same example because on the one side you've got Libya with an intervention and a United Nations resolution and the French and the British and a, uh, a, a semi-coalition of other countries all saying we, we are intervening. And you have next door across the Suez, you've got Bahrain, where another government is beating everything out of uh, its own population and a majority population. A minority government is beating down on a majority population and we are keeping quiet, totally quiet. We don't see it at all. Nobody talks of Bahrain. 
Why? Because Bahrain is where the seventh fleet is uh, is uh, stationed, and Bahrain is oil. So you see, it's it's the the question of intervention is determined by the Security Council. International intervention has to be approved by the Security Council. And the Security Council is five permanent members, meaning each one of them has the right of veto, which means no intervention can take place in any place where any one of the five does not agree. That is the simple principle and the, and the truth in international relations. And so intervention is where intervention is. That's the answer to your question. I will intervene where I want to intervene. And I will not intervene where I don't want to intervene. And it's not for you to ask me that question because I am a permanent member of the Security Council and it's not for you to ask me any questions at all. Permanent membership plus veto is the same as divine right. No questions can be asked. No questions, now or ever in the future. Permanence, as you know, is an attribute of God. There's no human attribute which is permanent. And so anybody who calls himself permanent, to begin with, is calling himself God. And then you give yourself the veto, which is the absolute right to say no. No questions asked. Nobody can ask a question to say, why do you say no? I don't have to tell you. At one stage when I uh, was a trustee of Fairleigh Dickinson University, somebody congratulated me and said, this is a very powerful post because you can say no at any time. And I said, but if, what happens if, I, if somebody asks me, why are you saying no? He says, well, all that you have to reply is, I don't like the smell of it. That is the only justification that veto members have to give. I don't like the smell of it. Over to Bronx, for two questions from the Bronx. Hi, Mr. Kamel. Uh, my name is Luke Malamani from Proximity College, you already know. Uh, my question is uh, regarding internet access in Africa. Uh, part of the United Nations Millennium uh, Development Goals is to ensure universal education, including the access to the internet, in particular and information in general. Uh, we know for a fact that the internet has played a crucial role in the recent Middle Eastern and North African uprising. However, Africa in the south of Sahara has the lowest internet access. Do you think the governments are maintaining this status quo voluntarily? to avoid youth uprising? And what is the United Nations doing in ensuring internet access in Africa? Thank you. Very good. Second question. Yes, hi. Uh, good question. The, with the rise in Chinese investment to the tune of several billion dollars, or several hundred billion dollars over the past several years in various African nations where they end up, they being the Chinese government, end up controlling that road, that port, that oil installation. What, how do you think that bodes for future uh, control, say, as they're becoming the de facto replacement colonial power or dominant political force as a foreign power in, in the African continent? Thank you. Very good questions again. <clears throat> Let's take the first one first. <clears throat> the question was, what is the depth of internet penetration in Africa? And if it is not adequate south of the Sahara, why not? And it's a fair question. It's a fair question because I have dealt with this personally. I've dealt with it because of my interest in the internet and in information technology. And I found a few years ago that I just could not get a simple map of internet tubes in Africa because broadband has to go along pipes 
what is the pipes, internet pipes in Africa? Where are they going? They exist for the rest of the world. You know what is the width of the pipe between New York and London, for example. But what is the width of the pipe going into Gabon or into, I don't know, uh, Guinea-Bissau? Is it this wide? Is it this narrow? Does it exist at all? Are there pipes for the internet to go into Africa? Because the internet is a system. It works very well, but it still requires pipes, which are telephone lines and broadband later on. And we could not get a map of Africa to tell us what are the pipes in Africa. Nobody had thought of Africa. It was a forgotten continent. And I asked this question in the UN. Why is it the forgotten continent? Because at that stage, 90% of the telephone lines in Africa, south of the Sahara, 90%, I repeat, were in one country alone, South Africa, which was just emerging from apartheid. So it was a white country in black Africa. <clears throat> and so the question was, how is it that there is no access? Africa is not a, a cheap country. It's not a cheap or poor country. It is the richest countries in the world. You take a country like the Congo. It has extraordinary riches, far richer than anything that you can imagine. But the riches of these countries, whether they are in minerals, or whether they are in agricultural products or in rare earths. Remember that there is a rare earth called coltan, C-O-L-T-A-N. Africa has the nigh monopoly of coltan. Each and every cell phone needs coltan. Each and every cell phone. So you are totally dependent on coltan from Africa for your cell phones. And I would imagine then that they can determine the price and what, what they want from you in exchange, namely the pipes to go into Africa, the internet pipes. But they are not there. And so the question is, is it a problem of the colonial powers for not wanting to put pipes into Africa? Or is it a problem of the local governments? who are using the money to eat ice cream or to put the money into their bank accounts in Switzerland and are not interested in expanding the pipes. Because after all, it's not for me, an outsider, to put pipes into some African country and telephones there. It's for the country itself to do it. And why can't it do it? It has the money, it has the resources, it has extraordinary riches in Africa. They have everything, everything in Africa. And so I just didn't understand and I still don't understand except for one ray of light which is slowly emerging. And that is that the African Union is coming together. Africa is coming together as a continent. And I find that the leadership in Africa is beginning to meet regularly and to set up regular exchange of views and decision-making, and that is a hopeful sign. But we have to stop the wars first, because in the middle of a war you cannot have uh, pipes going into Africa. And so take the Congo, for example. The Congo is a huge country. It's the richest country in Africa and perhaps the richest country in the world. But all the colonial and external powers have, are treating it like a big bowl of Coca-Cola. And each one of them has got a straw into it and they're drinking out the straw, the Coke, or the blood of uh, the Congo from different sides. Congo has nine neighbors around it. All the neighbors are drinking, it, are sucking out its blood through straws. And so, <clears throat> I can't answer your question because there is, I can understand the colonial powers wanting 
to suck everything out of Africa. It's in their interest. But it's in the African interest to prevent that from happening. And that is what is called governance. And that I don't see. And so if you're looking at external powers to come and save you and give you salvation, then that's not how it works. You are responsible for your own salvation. And you have to stand up and ask for it and come together and ensure it. Your second question is an unfair question. It's unfair because we look at China as if it is doing things which are new. But all of us have been doing the same things in Africa. The history of Africa is the history of external powers. It is the Western world which has sucked the blood dry in Africa. It is the Western world which has reduced Africa into a basket case of, uh, of uh, unfair borders and colonial heritage and uh, mineral resources mal utilized with low prices, uh, etc. So the, the, the Western world has absolutely no right to point a finger at China because if you do, you will find the three fingers are pointing back at you yourself. Remember that. Now you talk about China. Just as others have their interests, China has its interests also. But please do not underestimate China. China is not a minor country. It's not a country born 200 years ago. It's a country born 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years of recorded history and culture and scientific inventions. Make, try to make a list of just four inventions from China which have changed the world. In the third century, I repeat, the third century, which most people in the United States have never heard of, the third century. In the third century, China had invented paper and the compass. Both of them absolutely essential products for civilization. Paper, because that's where, why you are at university, and the compass, because that enables us to travel around the world and for me to talk to you. Third century. By the sixth century, China had invented printing, block printing, far before the Gutenberg Bible, which all of you know about uh, Europe. China had block printing in the sixth century during the Han Dynasty. And by the Tang Dynasty in the eighth century, China had invented gunpowder, which is what enables you to have your broad chess and to play football as aggressively as you do. So please, please remember that we are not in a world of we and they. We are in a globalized world in which all of us have benefited from each other. We have benefited from China, just as China is benefiting from us. Yesterday, there is a huge Chinese delegation in town here at the United Nations today, out here to learn from the United States. This is a 5,000-year-old country, which has come here to learn from a 200-year-old country. And they do it with modesty. But I think we owe to them equivalent modesty because China has interests and those interests as it emerges as a or rather not emerges but re-emerges as a power. China was a global power always but then it had its down days and now it is coming back into its own and as it does it will play a role. It is one-fifth of the population of the world. It works harder than anybody else anywhere and it is willing to reinvest a larger proportion of their earnings than anybody else anywhere. China reinvests 20% of their income into, uh, uh, into savings, 
Remember that, because we are living in a country which has no savings, which only has deficits. <coughs> China has savings. China has is spending 120 billion dollars a year on research and development. That's two and a half percent of their GDP. And so, please do not underestimate China. It's not a government. It's a people. And it's a people with enormous civilization and strength in its DNA. I'm sorry to be so aggressive with a question which was politely asked. And so, uh, I apologize for my aggressiveness. Over to Mercy for two questions from that. From that. Hi, my name is Sabrine. Um, Ivory Coast or Nigeria and some other African countries it has been difficult to get democracy to work smoothly. Are the problems related to the damage brought by col col wait, I'm sorry. Oh, brought by colonialism upon traditional values of respect, honesty, and community? Thank you. Okay, second question. Is it possible to realize the Western style of democracy in Islamic countries such as Libya, Tunisia, or Egypt? Thank you. I see both questions from Mercy uh, relate to democracy. Uh, whether uh, democracy is possible in, uh, in Africa and whether democracy, Western democracy is possible in um, Islamic countries. Well, first of all, I think we have to be slightly critical about the Western definition of democracy. The Western definition of democracy is what is called periodic and genuine elections. Elections are periodic, no doubt, in, in the West. But about their genuineness, I'm not too sure. Because the fundamentals of Western democracy are in Plato and in his book, The Republic. In The Republic, Plato wrote about an ideal state in which you have democracy, meaning the responsibility of the governors towards the governed. That is Plato's definition of democracy. And then he went on to say, this is too serious a business to be left to the hoi polloi or the masses. And therefore, we have to train the governors. And Plato then says the children should be taken away from their parents and taken into special training establishments and the best ones among them then chosen to come up and to become what he calls statesmen or governors. Now, mind you, all Western civilization is said to be a footnote to Plato. All Western civilization is a footnote to Plato. So we have to go back to Plato to study Western democracy. Because we find, for example, when he said that we must train the trainers, that's exactly what we do. We hijack children from their parents and put them in schools and colleges and universities away from their parents. We don't trust the parents. We trust Mercy College, not the parents, uh, to bring up uh, children. And that is, again, we are going back into Plato. But on the question of democracy, Plato said that you have to have justice, which he, by which he meant fairness in society. Now, please examine two or three things in Western democracy. The idea of Western democracy is majority rule. That's not Plato. Plato was talking of good rule, not majority rule. If you ask the majority in any country, do you want to watch football or Baywatch on television? Or do you want to watch uh, Charlie Rose? The vast majority will vote in favor of football and Baywatch. But that does not mean that football and Baywatch is better than Charlie Rose and C-SPAN. 
So you see the difference between majority rule and good rule. And that is problem number one with Western democracy. Problem number two is the role of money. Money plays an enormous role in Western democracy. And you note that when we are talking even of the re-election of next year in the United States, everybody is interested in how much money is Obama going to be raising? And how much money is the Tea Party going to be raising? Nobody is interested in, in their manifestos. They all want to know money. Because the more money, the more television ads, the more we can brainwash people in the street. And so the role of money in buying votes, which is bribery, and you can call it by any other name, but money plays an enormous role in Western democracy. And number three is the problem of the media. The media plays a most uh, reprehensible role in Western democracy. It takes sides and it takes sides which are, uh, which are indefensible. I don't want to name names about the media, but there are people on the media who are talking absolute nonsense. But the more nonsense you speak and the more repeatedly you speak the nonsense, the more chances that you will convince some people in the street to buy your foolish argument. And that, I'm afraid, is wrong. Now, in the West, some of these problems have been resolved in some countries. In Europe, for example, you cannot raise money for a private, uh, you cannot raise money yourself. The state allocates money for each candidate. The state allocates how much time is each candidate is going to have on television. You cannot buy extra time on television. So that is one effort to try to control the ills of Western democracy. But in spite of that, if you examine any of the countries in the West or the East, you find that controls are not with the democratic mass. Controls are always with an aristocratic minority. They say that France, for example, is controlled by less than 2,000 people, the whole of France. And so if a minority is controlling, going to control a whole country, that is not democracy. That is aristocracy or oligarchy. And so I'm not a great defender of Western democracy, probably because I come from Pakistan, which is a dictatorship, and therefore we are safe and happy in dictatorships because everything is stable and we know whose hand to kiss every morning. Uh, but uh, that's problem number one. Problem number two is that you, when you refer to Africa, somehow there is behind that question there is the arrogance of a person who says, I am superior to these Africans. Therefore, I need to teach them about democracy. I regret you are a child of Africa. You are born in Africa. Africa has far more democratic uh, tribal principles than anybody can believe. Primitive societies are far more democratic than sophisticated societies. And you see that here in this country among the American Indians who are far more democratic in their decision making uh, than, than, than we are. And so don't look down upon tribal societies in Africa. Let us all work together to stop this dictatorship by a few poor governance leaders who have emerged out of colonialism and who have emerged because we have defended them. It is the colonial powers who were defending 
the Mobutus and the Gaddafis and the Mubaraks. Remember that. They would not have survived in their own societies. They survived only because we were supporting them. And so if there is any fault, if there is anybody who should be hanging his heads in shame, it is us and not them. Over to Vancouver for two questions from Vancouver. And once again, uh, I'm delighted that Vancouver gets up so early in the morning to spend time with us. Um, hi. I've heard of the saying that um, good dictatorship is better than bad democracy. What is your opinion on that? <laughs> okay. Second question. <laughs> Only one question from Vancouver. <laughs> My name is Myung Jun Choi, or uh, study in Imperial Analytics University of Vancouver. What is your your own definition of uh, democracy? Sir, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, very good question. <laughs> The objective of Vancouver is obviously to put me in a corner. And so I admire, uh, uh, I think they're taking it out on me because I have made them get up early in the morning. So they said, OK, we'll, we'll teach you how to suck eggs. Uh, good. Uh, the objective of leadership is not democracy. The objective of leadership is good governance. And the question is, how do you achieve good governance? Once again, go back to the origins. The origins in this case are with Aristotle. Aristotle defined six types of government. He said the best government is benevolent dictatorship, good dictatorship, what you call good dictatorship, benevolent dictatorship, is the best. The second best is responsible uh, aristocracy. And the third type is uh, democracy. So for him, the top democracy is the third out of three possibilities. But then he inverts these and he says, let us examine what happens if things go wrong. And he says, well, if good dictatorship goes haywire, then it becomes bad dictatorship. If aristocracy goes bad, it becomes oligarchy. And if democracy goes bad, it becomes mob rule. So now Aristotle has drawn a chart of six possibilities, three goods and three bads. And after examining all of them, he says, I prefer to stay in the middle with democracy because democracy is not very good. But when it goes bad, it's not very bad either. That is the Aristotelian definition of democracy. It's not very good, but it's not very bad either. But remember that our job as human beings, as students, and students mean the governors of the future, that's what you are. As students in the Platonic sense, as statesmen of the future, your objective is to achieve the maximum, not the minimum. You don't have to accept Aristotle saying, well, let's accept the minimum out of the three because it is not too good, but it's not too bad either. That is not good enough. Go for the maximum. Good governance is what we need. And we've had enormous examples, enormous examples in history of leaders who were good leaders, who were dictatorial because they were kings, or uh, self-imposed, 
but who changed the world. There was a chap in 1750 BC, I repeat, 1750 BC, in Iraq, called Mesopotamia at the time. His name is Hammurabi, who wrote the first code of civil laws. The first code of civil laws called Hammurabi's Code. And it starts with the words, I, Hammurabi, hereby enact these rules so that, and please listen carefully, so that justice may prevail in the kingdom and the strong may not oppress the weak. These are the opening lines of Hammurabi's Code in 1750 BC. He is not a democrat, he is a dictator. But he's a good dictator because he identifies the correct concepts of good governance. And so the objective is good governance. And our job as individuals and as collectivists, because we are each one of us is an individual, but we also have to act together. Our job is to devote ourselves to good governance. The problem is that good governance requires a very high moral caliber. And that moral caliber and how that moral caliber is to be achieved is a problem that we have been dealing with for thousands of years. Some of us have sought that moral caliber in religions and spirituality. Others have forgotten religion and spirituality and think that they can find moral caliber in the local pub or the local cafe, which is what is called secularism, but it's for you to judge. The objective is a yardstick of standards of good governance, of public awareness and public service. We have forgotten public service and devoted ourselves to chasing money rather than giving service. And think about it, that the objective of life is not achieving money, it is achieving happiness. And you might achieve happiness with fewer money in your pocket, and you may achieve unhappiness with larger money in your pocket. You may also go to jail with larger money in your pocket. Remember Mr. Madoff, uh, he had a lot of money, and look where he is now. So I think I've answered both the questions together, that for me, democracy is good governance. How you achieve good governance is free for you. You can achieve it from one man or a group of people or a wider group. But don't sell yourself to the majority. The majority is for football and not for C-SPAN and Charlie Rose. Remember that. Over to Teaneck for two questions from that end. Yeah, of course. Uh, hello, good morning, uh, Ambassador Kamal. I have uh, two short questions. One, uh, is Gaddafi a dictator, according to you, uh, and should he go? And secondly, if um, you think a regional solution would have uh, worked instead of the U.S. and others intervening into, into the Libyan crisis? Good questions, and I'm glad because they are really short. Gaddafi, uh, I am not in a position to judge Mr. Gaddafi. He, he, uh, if I was, if I was in a position to judge Colonel Gaddafi, I would say, he is a crazy man. But I am not Libyan. I am not from the region. I don't know. I, as an outsider, I find him funny. I don't find him bad. I just find him funny. He dresses funny. He talks funny. He acts funny. But if the Libyans want him, well, that's the Libyan problem, not mine. And so I do not know what is his strength? Because please 
do not underestimate the fact that he does have support, enough support to be keeping pushing back the, uh, the opposition despite the intervention from the United Nations and France and Britain and the United States. This person who looks so funny is managing to push all of them back all the time. And so your second question then becomes even more important. Shouldn't we have a regional solution? That is already in process. You have one regional solution being proposed by the United States, Britain, France, and the United Nations, which is Colonel Gaddafi go. And you have a second regional solution on the part of the African Union, which is totally different, which says, Colonel Gaddafi, just talk to the opposition. Let's have dialogue. So there are two totally different regional solutions. And we don't know which of the two will prevail. But note that the Africans have a position which is different from that of the United Nations. Over to Madison for two questions from that end. Are pretty brutal. Madison. What if, what if anything, is the United Nations and the African Union doing to alleviate some of the, these evils in these refugee camps? In the refugee camps, did you say refugee camps? Yes. Did he not? He yes. Yeah, refu 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 yes, he said refugee camps. Yeah. Uh, would you amplify which refugee camps are you talking about? Uh, Say it again. Should I just restate my question? Particularly in Chad and uh, northern Uganda, the refugee camps are they're very brutal. What, if anything, is the United Nations and the African Union doing to try and uh, solve some of the evils in those refugee camps? Okay. Second question. Um, good morning, uh, Ambassador Kamal. Um, I just have a question regarding the African Union. Are they drawing inspiration from the European Union, and is that even a structural model of governance that could possibly work in Africa? Or is, are they um, looking for something entirely different, something a little bit more separate? Okay. Um, the refugee camps, uh, as I told you earlier, the refugee load in Africa came as a big surprise to us. And I was the chairman of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And we were absolutely surprised by the shift away from Asia into Africa, because we had not expected it. And the problem was that the intensity of the fighting in Rwanda, and later on in other parts of Africa, absolutely surprised us. We had no idea that these ethnic tensions were not a question of dislike, but a question of mutual murder. And on a very high scale, you have no idea how many people are dying in Africa. People in the Congo are dying by the millions, millions. Compare that to the two or three thousand people who died in 9-11. We are talking of millions in one country alone. And so this is large scale murder, large scale. And obviously then people run away and they try to get into camps. And camps are very poorly run because we just don't have enough money. And so camps give you two types of problems. One is the problem of food, and the other is the problem of safety. And so you find that the camps are rife with uh, rapes and prostitution and drugs and uh, shortages of food. They are in terrible shape all over Africa. And you don't even have mosquito nets or tents for that matter. And so it's, it's not easy living. And the question is, what can be done about it? Well, ultimately it comes down to money. Each morsel of food costs money. 
Each mosquito net costs money. Each uh, supervision of women against rape costs money. And there's no money. People are not willing to stick out money. Not for Africa. Certainly not for Africa. So Africa is in bad shape. And the answer ultimately, and that is where it is linked to the other question about the African Union, ultimately Africa will have to find its own solutions. And those solutions will have to depend on the proper pricing of African goods. Africa has a control over the world. It has gold, it has diamonds, it has coltan, it has minerals, it has everything. It has cocoa. All of you are having coffee and chocolate all the time. Well, Africa controls it. Let them double the price. After all, you are paying $3 in uh, Starbucks for a cup of coffee. The countries which are producing coffee, Kenya, and I think that's why the Kenyan ambassador didn't come because she's getting only seven cents out of the three dollars in Starbucks for coffee. Only seven cents is going to the Kenyan farmer. And so let them pull up their prices exactly like the OPEC countries pulled up the price of oil. And that might bring greater ability to handle the financial problems of the continent. But your second question also has an overtone, because somehow you used the European Union as the standard. There are three standards in uh, integration. The first standard is the United States. The United States was 13 separate countries, totally separate. And then they decided to come together. And it was not easy because they had to go through a whole process. But ultimately they did. And they did by discovering this extraordinary genius. The genius of the American people is in the Connecticut Compromise. The manner in which this country discovered federalism. That is the key to the United States. That you have a division of powers between the Federation and the states. And that is the key. That's uh, system number one. System number two is Europe. Europe is totally different. Europe is not based on federalism. Europe is based on the hatred of Germany. That is the governing force in Europe. The French hate the Germans. Because they said, these damn Germans, they come every 10 or 15 years, they have wars with us, let's get them by the you-know-what. And so they got them by the you-know-what in the coal and steel community first, and then expanded it into the European Union. But the cement which holds the European Union together is the French reservations about Germany. That is the key. You need a cement to hold Europe together. And that cement is fear or uh, uh, reservations about Germany and what the Germans are up to. Because the Germans are hardworking and they have coal and they have steel. And whereas the French are spending all their time with, in the restaurants or with their mistresses. And so you can't compete with the Germans. And so the French said, OK, then let's have a European Union. And that's the way to control them. Now that cement is what holds the European Union together and then it was amplified by a process in which all the laws and rules were harmonized. And so today there is free movement <coughs> in Europe like in the United States. <coughs> you can drive from, if you have a Schengen, you, have, you can drive from Portugal to Poland without having a passport or without showing any, you just drive through, there are no borders. Just as you can drive from New York to San Francisco without having a passport. 
So that is the European model based on a different formula. The African model is based on objection towards colonialism. <clears throat> because this is a continent which has really been mistreated by everybody. Anybody and everybody has mistreated Africa and continues to do it. The winds of change are passing through. You remember my answer to the internet question. In the middle of the world where everybody has cell phones and internet, you have a whole continent where you don't know who's got a cell phone or where or what is the internet access. And so it is being bypassed winds of change. And if change comes into Africa, it will come really through China because China is coming deep into Africa and is bringing uh, uh, international recognition. So from one side you have China and from the other side you have Brazil. Both of them are coming deep into Africa. <coughs> so Africa will come up because it is Africa. It's the mother load. It will come up because of China. It will come up because of Brazil. And it will come up despite Europe and the United States. Sorry to be so pessimistic. I leave it to you to close this session from your end. Um, thank you. Let me thank you, Ambassador Kamal, uh, for uh, picking up uh, the, uh, the role of uh, Ambassador Josefino Giamo, as well as your own usual role in, this, uh, in these sessions. And uh, I have no doubt that everything that's been said here uh, will be a prelude to a, uh, uh, many, many conversations about this issue, which are sure to come in the coming months and years. So all of us appreciate your being here today. Uh, today's session, let me remind everyone, will be posted on FDU's Global Education website as part of the United Nations Pathways video conference series. Let me thank everyone and all of our participating institutions uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much. And from my side, I want to apologize to everybody for being so aggressive. Uh, and because I've been hitting at everybody, I'll make sure that I do not go behind the church at night uh, out of fear for my safety. <laughs> Goodbye from the U.S. Bye.